I've been talking to you in recent weeks. David mentioned about grace, how we got to expand our capacity for God's grace because Jesus is our grace. We are saved by grace through faith. It's more than an adjective. It's a noun and also a pronoun. First Adam came and fell, right? Gave up his identity. Eve gave up her identity as what? Children of God. God made them the head. He put them in charge. And they gave up that identity. And then they received a curse because God said there'd be a curse. They ate the, of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. We weren't equipped to handle evil. That's why we don't do well with evil, especially when we're doing, operating in our life, living our life without God and without an understanding and a revelation of who he is and who we are in him. Because evil is so strong Adam and Eve felt like they could handle knowledge of good and evil. They didn't know what evil was. They'd never seen it, never heard it, never tasted it. But once they partook of that tree, evil always begins with disobedience. You know, whenever God was upset that the children of Israel wanted a king in Judges, and then in First uh, Kings, First Chronicles, is it or Kings, whatever, uh, when Samuel was the judge, the Bible says. He's the priest. He's the only person that walked in the prophetic, the priestly anointing, and the prophetic anointing, and really the kingly anointing. And whenever he told the people, okay, Israel, you want a king, but they're going to take your land, they're going to take your sons and have them serve them in their army, they're going to take your daughters and have them be the servants around their household and their vineyards and their farms. Instead of the God being your king, the king of all kings, and you living under his covenant authority, now you're going to live like man does under theirs. And they didn't know how to handle it. And Saul was pretty good in the beginning, but it wasn't long before he disobeyed God at his command. And he told Samuel, I'm done with this guy. I've raised up another one. The last thing that broke the straw of the camel's back is when Saul had went to kill a group of Amalekites and their king, God said, go wipe them out. The king, everything, I want everything destroyed, all the animals. But instead, he kept the king because he wanted a trophy, and he kept all the good beasts and animals, and he brought them back to the camp. And he was supposed to wait for Samuel to uh, even begin any kind of sacrifice, but he started a sacrifice. And when Samuel come, he says, you come against the Lord. The Lord said, that's it. You're no longer going to be king. You'll be removed from king. He said, well, I did all that you asked. He said, what do you mean you did all that I asked and all that God asked? He said, I killed everyone. I took all the stuff. He said, now, he said, well, what's the bleeding of the sheep I hear? He, well, we just kept the good sheep and the good animals because I was a little afraid of the people. They, the soldiers, they wanted that. Uh, but we're still sacrificing to the Lord. And he said, bring the king to me. And he cut the king's head off, Samuel did. Then he walked away and he told him, from this day forward, you, you would be replaced. You're no longer a king in God's eyes. And that's when David came on the scene. But the key statement he said, because Samuel kept telling him all he did, obedience, obedience. This is what I've done for you, Lord. Like, like we're going to do good things for God and hold it over him, right? When he sent his only begotten son that we can be saved. And he said to him, Samuel said, obedience is better than sacrifice. Obedience is better than sacrifice. So anytime you face evil and it overcomes you, you face disease, you face heartache, you face an attack on your finances, your family, whenever it comes up in your spirit, you know that you've transgressed. You've had a sin of transgression. Repent immediately before the Lord and just give it to Him. Like I said a couple weeks ago, be like a goldfish in five seconds. Don't even remember it anymore. Because God has made you new. So evil is something we weren't equipped to handle. Sin is something we weren't equipped to handle. It was not meant for us to do that. God wanted us to be in his image and his own likeness. We created them, both male and female, what? To be the head and not the tail, above and not to be beneath. Said that I want you to be in charge of what? Everything that creeps on the ground, everything in the air, everything it is, is, is under your domain, your dominion. It's your kingdom. Basically, domain means what they're kings over. God made them king of the Garden of Eden. He said, now go forth and subdue and take over. There was areas God wanted them to subdue and take over, but they couldn't even get out of the garden 
I don't know if they were there 10 years, 100 years, 1,000 years, or a million years with God, ever how long they were in the garden with God before they transgressed. You see, you and I are not equipped to fight disease on our own. We're not equipped to fight addiction on our own. We're not equipped to fight unforgiveness and bitterness and offense on our own. Those are all fruits of the knowledge that we weren't even supposed to be a part of. You say, well, why are a lot of people that are great people that are never healed or never delivered or never healed and, and they go on to be with the Lord? Well, I can't explain all that, but I do know what God's word says. And he has reasons that he takes his hand and lets people go to heaven early. But remember, heaven is not second place. <laughs> To be asked for your body is to be present with the Lord. You're, you're no longer sick, right? You're going out in to, to be in a place of honor worshiping God. But God set his original domain and dominion up with Adam and Eve. And then they threw it away, brought the curse of sickness, of poverty, of addiction, all of those things, bitterness and hatred on us. And out of that, we lost our identity. And then in Matthew's gospel, whenever Jesus was getting ready to preach to the 5,000, I think it was, um, John was in prison. John the Baptist, who was called alongside Jesus. And the Bible said, even Jesus himself said, he's, there's been no greater prophet than John the Baptist. And he was called and born into this earth to usher in and announce Jesus, the Son of God. And he'd already done that. But now he's with, in, in prison with Herod and they're getting ready to chop his head off. And he sent his, some of his disciples to Jesus. He said, go and make sure, check, check, just make sure. He wanted to know for sure and have peace that Jesus was the son of God, even though he announced him before anyone else did and recognized him. It shows you we get isolated in a dark place, how the enemy can make something that's so real and so true, make us doubt it. Doubt, diconia in the Greek language means to separate from oneself. What? Yourself. What? When you're a born again Christian, you're a son or daughter of God. So then you separate from your identity and kingship in God back to your old human nature, your old human power, your old human assets and authority. But God has set us up at a time such as this. And you could have been born in any time or dispensation but you're born in this dispensation called the dispensation of grace, the dispensation of Jesus. And we have this time until Jesus reappears. The Bible says he'll come in a twinkling of an eye, he'll appear. And even then, he's going to call us up, those that are children of God, into heaven with him and let earth have its battle. But then he'll come back and set up his kingdom for a thousand years called the millennial reign. Once that's done and everybody comes to God that can, then he'll destroy the earth and create a new heaven and a new earth. Why? Because there was a sin in heaven. Satan, who was named Lucifer, and a third of the angels came against God. Isaiah says, in a place in Isaiah, it says that the five I wills, I will ascend, I will rule, I will. And he wanted to take the domain of God. And God had Micah, his archangel, kick him out of heaven. The book of Luke says, and he hit the ground like lightning. Hit the earth. He and a third of his angels. And because of that, God said, there's going to be a day that I even create my own heaven brand new. Wow. A new heaven and a new earth. Why? To take away any thought or remembrance of sin or disobedience or rebellion. So it's very critical that we understand this statement that I'm getting ready to say. And I've talked about it for weeks now. The supernatural is a critical component of the end time church. The supernatural is the critical component, component of the end time church. Why? Because people may not listen to what we say or believe what we say, but they cannot deny the wonders and the works of God. And, and I know we're in this end time church. I don't know if that's 10 years, 100 years or whatever it is, but we're part of the end time church. Therefore, we must get a revelation of accessing heaven and making it manifest in the earth. Oh, what are you talking about, pastor? Turn with me to, uh, I want to read this, guys. Put the, the, the Passion Translation up. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16. All good. We're going to flow here in a minute. I just feel my spirit. I need to flow. 
and some expression of God. You see, Madam, writing this book, Lord, I was in it again yesterday. My goodness. Knowing the ways of God. Hallelujah. Hmm. A road map to the supernatural. It's so critical for the body of Christ right now. You know, we've seen we can't control elections. We can't control, you know, politics. We can't control our health in many situations, our kids, our finances. All, you know, it, why? Because God created it where we depended on him and he would bring those things into order. We got to do the best we can do. Jesus asked Jesus how to pray. Jesus said, pray like this. Now, this will be different than you hear it in, you know, how it be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth. Uh, we'll compare it in a moment. But I love this translation. He said, pray like this, Jesus said. Our beloved Father, dwelling in the heavenly realms, somebody say realms, may the glory of your name be the center on which our lives turn. Manifest your kingdom realm. Think about that. Manifest your kingdom realm and cause your every purpose to be fulfilled in the earth, on the earth just as it is in heaven. And that's the theme of two streams coming up here not long from now, as in heaven. What? That you manifest your kingdom realm and cause your every purpose to be fulfilled on earth just as it is in heaven. We acknowledge you as our provider of all we need each day. Forgive us of our wrongs that we have done as our, as we ourselves release forgiveness to those who have wronged us. Rescue us every time when we face tribulation and set us free from evil. For you are the king who rules with power and glory forever. Amen. Now I want to teach you from this just for a moment. Well, okay, hold yourself there. Now I'm going to take you somewhere else. Go to Matthew's Gospel 16, a familiar scripture that you hear a lot. I'm going to read it out of the Passion Translation. Hallelujah. And this is where when Peter, you know, the rock, all that good stuff, Jesus asked Peter, who do you say that I am? He said, uh, I say you're the son of God. He said, how, how would we even know that? We wouldn't even know that. But you, all you knew it was by my father from heaven, a revelation. And he's therefore I call you Peter, and upon this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail. I'll give you the keys to the kingdom of God, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against my church. So let me read it from the Passion Translation. Verse 13. It says, When Jesus came to Caesarea Philippi, he asked the disciples this question, What are the people saying about me? The Son of Man. What are people saying about me, the Son of Man? Who do they believe I am? He gave them the answer. <laughs> right? Okay. And so we got to realize this is a beautiful area in the north of uh, Galilee, the Sea of Galilee, which is really more like a lake of Galilee. And um, it's located in the foothills of Mount Hermon. And it's really where the headwaters come out of the River Jordan. And there's a lot of stuff great there about it, but I don't want to talk about it right now. And this is where he's teaching them. Verse 14, they answered. Some are convinced that you are John the bapt baptizer. Others say you are Elijah the reincarnated or Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Verse 15, but you, who do you say that I am? Jesus asked again. And Simon Peter spoke up and said, you are the anointed one, the son of the living God. You are the anointed one, the son of the living God. And Jesus replied, and said, you are favored and pri privileged, Simeon. Simon is one way it's pronounced, but Simeon, son of Jonah, for you didn't discover this on your own. But my father in heaven, somebody say in heaven, has supernaturally revealed it to you. You see, revelation, when you hear the word of God, the Bible says, how you grow in faith? By hearing the word of God and by hearing the word of God, we grow in faith. Hearing it in the natural, but then hearing it through revelation that God gives you through his spirit on it is a supernatural event. So the word Jonah, and you've heard me teach this before, means dove. And Simeon means uh, one who hears. So he's talking about a dove represents the Holy Spirit. So his name, his new name is his old name and new name together. It means one who hears the spirit. 
So Peter heard the Father's whisper from heaven that Jesus is the Christ, and his Hebrew name represents it. But Peter became his identity as Jesus gave him the nickname Peter or Pebble. Peter means pebble. And then he said, verse 18, I give you the name Peter or pebble, a stone, a small pebble, right? And this rock will be the bedrock upon the foundation of which I will build my church. So whenever we look at that, the word Petra means pebble. Petros means massive rock. And what Jesus was referring to, if you even go back to the Aramaic, was you're a pebble, part of the bedrock, the massive rock, Petros, me. And the Bible says Jesus will be what? The cornerstone of the church. That means that's the most important stone of all. And everything is built by that measurement and upon it. And that's what everything stands by. So we get this. He said, Peter or Petra, stone of the bedrock. He said, the only way he became that was because of revelation. And I want you to realize, you have revelation in your life all the time that's supernatural and you ignore it. You, you say, oh, God gave me a nugget. No, that's a revelation. And that didn't come by your natural. That came by God super touching your natural. See, we underestimate ourselves and our identity in Christ. Therefore, we don't manifest who we are in Christ. And he said, you're a foundation on which I will build my church. And then he explains what church is. My legislative assembly. Hmm. You say, well, where do you get church is uh, legislative assembly? Well, whenever we begin to look at this, we begin to realize that that's actually the word for ecclesia or ecclesia. And that's what it means. The word church is ecclesia. I always say ecclesia. And that really means legislative assembly. The only place we, you know, we hear church, we understand it. But what I want you to realize, God's kingdom is a legislative assembly. Why does he call it a kingdom, a place where it's his domain? The church is not just to be a bunch of people gathering together. We're supposed to be children, sons and daughters of God gathering together as his legislative assembly. That means we set forth the standard, don't we? It says, I will build my church, my legislative assembly, and the power of death will not be able to overpower it. So he's telling us that death does not even have power over what God wants to do on our part. It also, ecclesia also means selected ones. Selected ones and legislative assembly. And you hear me say it per 1 Peter 2, 9. He said, you're my chosen people, a royal, a peculiar people, a royal priesthood who are to show forth the praises of me, the kingdom of God. He said, show forth the praises of the kingdom of God or the legislative assembly. And what? You show forth the praise to show forth in, in, and bring light where there's darkness. So we are to be the light of God. We are the ones what that do legislate the kingdom domain on the earth. In other words, God's not going to do anything on this earth unless he does it through one of his children. That's his own word to us. We are the, re the church is supposed to be the place where people can access God and we can take God out beyond the four walls as his legislators of his kingdom. Hmm. Then he says in verse uh, 19, I will give you the keys. Somebody say keys of heaven's kingdom realm. So it goes on. Kingdom or king's domain is talking about a realm. We live in what? An earth realm right here, right? And the fact that we live in this realm, Paul said there's really three realms or three heavens. He said there's the earth and this realm. Then there's a second heaven called the firmament that when God created it, it's the only day that he said was not good. And then the third heaven, Paul said, I know of a man that went up to the third heaven where sat the Son of God at the right hand of the Father. So there's three realms on this planet, I mean, that we are uh, uh, affected by. 
earth and this realm is a heavenly body of God. The firmament, which is between the third heaven where God is and where we are. And that's where Satan has charge. And he, like Daniel, was praying to prayer. Oh, I got to stop. God said, you're doing too much. I'm just overloading you. Are you getting this? Because I feel like I'm really scared because I've got so much and I'm trying to, I'm wanting you to get something. So he says, I will give you the keys of heaven's kingdom realm. So you're in this realm, but we brought the, he brought the kingdom uh, to the earth. Jesus did. And he was asked about it. He said, the kingdom is not only near you, but in you now. And I asked about that scripture where it says, God, the king, and Jesus looked at his disciples. And he looked at the Pharisees, but he looked at his disciples and said, the kingdom of God is near you, talking about in him, but is in you now. And I said, Lord, how could that be? Because you haven't ascended yet. How could they receive the kingdom? Because they haven't received the Holy Spirit. This blew me away. Mark, look that scripture verse up so I can give it to him. I got it in my notes about where Jesus said that, boy, I am drunk in the spirit right now. I am just drunk in the spirit. Hallelujah. I'm heavy in the anointing right now. I'm just telling you. So, he said, the kingdom of God is not only near you, but the kingdom of God is in you now. And I said, Lord, I was praying. I was like, Lord, how? And it's maybe just a crazy doctor. I said, Lord, how could the king, he would say the kingdom of God is in them when he hadn't, Ascended to heaven and received, had Paracletos, the Holy Ghost, come down in Acts 1 and 2, right? For us to live in us when we're born again. And you know what the Lord told me, Kobe? He told me, he said, son, when you got saved, what got saved? Oh, John 3. When Nicodemus, the old, old uh, Pharisee, but he was like one of the great rulers, he said, what must I do to be born again? And he said, what? Well, you must uh, uh, see the kingdom of God. He said, well, I, uh, you, you must, he said, what must I do to be saved? He said, you must be born again. He said, well, how can I be born again? My mom's old, dead, I'm old. And what he said, he said, before you can enter the kingdom of God, you must be born again. Then he said, of what? Of the water and the word. Then he said, what else? How else can I see? He said, you must be born again to see the kingdom of God. So what we realized, then we look back there. At 1 Timothy 2, 9, where it says, whom he saved and called, saved and, not or, saved and called, not only according to your own works, but according to his own purpose in Christ Jesus before time began. What I want you to realize, sons and daughters, John said, I'm praying for your whole, W-H-O-L-E, spirit, soul, and body, spirit, soul, and body be found blameless in that day. You are a tripart being. You are a soul, which is your mind, your will, and your emotions. You are a body, flesh, blood, and bones. The Bible says in the body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, where his treasure of his Holy Spirit lives. But even before Holy Spirit came in there, your unliving or dormant spirit of who you really are in God, who he created you to be in spirit like him, is abiding in the state of death. But when we receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and confess our sin, receive him as Lord and Savior, what happens? We're washed by the water of the word of God and we're atoned by the blood of Jesus. That's our sacrifice. In other words, Jesus is our atonement. He took our sin. He took our sickness. He took our disease. All of that, Isaiah 53, 1 Peter 2, 24, that we can be saved or born again. And he talks about physical healing, spiritual healing, and also what? Emotional or solical healing. So, so what he told me was, he said the kingdom was in him, but it was dormant. The only way they could access my kingdom realm or domain is when they are born again. When they're born again, that kingdom domain that was put in them before time began is activated. So when you were born again, what you still had your mind, your body, what 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 came alive? Spirit. Your spirit. Your human spirit, which Genesis 1, 26 through 28 said is made in his own image and likeness, both male and female. The image of God, who we really are, our spirit, our communion and consciousness of God, our spirit, the Bible talks about, that's who we really are. We have a soul and it all lives in our body. 
You're a tripart being, just like Father, Son, Holy Ghost, flesh, bone, and blood. Have I lost you? The kingdom, if we could just get this, Tony, the kingdom of God lives in us. And like when Jesus told John's disciples, they're like, well, you know, he wanted to know, are you the true Messiah? He, he started quoting scriptures. He started saying, are the dead not raised? Are the sick not healed? Are the lost not saved? And all that. And they went back and told John the Baptist, he's ready to go to heaven. His, his job was done. He just needed reassurance. But I wanted to say to you, we're not equipped to be a long way away from the kingdom realm or with Jesus before we, we can even be John the Baptist. The greatest, Jesus said there was no greater prophet than John the Baptist. And you can be John the Baptist and still be terrorized by fear, by addiction, by, by disease, by poverty, by, by bitterness and hatred, and all those things when you are not living more in the kingdom realm than you are the earthly realm. Come on, living a supernatural lifestyle, what I've been talking about is how do I live or move in the realm of heaven? I want to rock you here in a minute. Yeah. We always thought heaven is up there, right? That's the way we were taught, the three heavens. Realms don't have a top and a bottom. They're a realm. We live in this realm. Then there's the firmament realm. And then there's a third heaven realm. Doesn't matter if it's up, down, or around. It doesn't. I'm, what I want you to do, how did Jesus walk when he came back after he rose from the dead and acts and preached for 40 days? Remember, he walked through a, a stone building, a rock build, building made out of rock where the disciples were and upbraided them for their unbelief. And he walked through to where they were having dinner, walked through the wall and sat down and had communion with them and upbraided them for their unbelief. Why, how could he do that? He was in one realm and he moved through a stone wall building and sat down and entered back into the realm and they saw him come through the building and they saw him leave. And he ate with them. We think it's Casper the ghost that'll fall out of his belly, right? He's just a floating cloud. No. How do you think Enoch was and he was not? You know, I always envision him, he's up in the air. No, he just went from this realm to that realm. Heaven's all around us. Why do you think the Bible says you have such, in Hebrews, you have such a great cloud of witnesses cheering you on? You got your witnesses that went before you all around you. It's heaven, but it's not as far away as you think. It's what the unseen realm. And the only way you can see it is with spiritual eyes. And the only way you can see it is releasing your faith through spiritual seeing to tap into it. One of our new members was talking to me on our call. I do a call with all of our new members after we get done. Just to, We do a Zoom call. And, and I won't say who she is. I don't want to bring attention to her. But she said, well, Pastor, you know, I saw this. You were, you, I looked over my, my friend that was with me and I made a comment about something going on. And then about that moment, I looked up and I saw this, I told her, I saw this round, this thing around you, like this color, this thing around you. And I said, look, I see this on Pastor And then you called me out and didn't know who I was and started prophesying to me exactly what I needed. And being heard, I was looking at each other, my God, I must have saw something. I saw this round, this color around Pastor. And then he called me out just on a Sunday morning. Nobody doing it, just called me out and prophesied. Praise God. You say, well, why do some people always get prophesied to and I never do? Because they are pulling from the heavenly realm and the gifts are drawn to them. I can go in a church of 5,000 if they're prophesying, I'll usually get prophesied to because I'm pulling on the realm. How do I live a supernatural lifestyle? I got to know how to move and live in the heavenly realm. Well, I don't know. That's the weirdest, craziest stuff I ever heard. Well, how you do it? He gave you keys. Somebody say keys. He said, I will give you key, the keys of heaven's kingdom realm uh, to, look at this now. We always say to bind on earth, to loosen heaven, to forbid on earth that which is forbidden in heaven. And to release on earth that which is released in heaven. Do that again. To forbid on that which is forbidden in heaven. God gives you the keys to forbid 
that which is forbidden. Anything, death, addiction, poverty, hatred, rape, that is not forbidden in heaven. So therefore you have authority to bind it. Anything that's not allowed in heaven or anyone, you can bind them. That's what God said. I give you the keys. And to release on earth that which is released in heaven. Supernatural, creation, favor, healing, peace, joy, all the things that we receive when we get to heaven. He says, I give you the authority as my sons and daughters to release it on the earth. Keys are symbols of authority and rule and power. So we see it as whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, whatever you loose on earth shall be loose in heaven. But it says, but he said, that with you, you forbid on earth must be that which is already forbidden in heaven. Anything that's not allowed in heaven is under our feet. Anything, cancer, sugar diabetes, right? Any sickle cell anemia, anything, Alzheimer's, anything, paralysis, anything. If it's forbidden in heaven, Sam, we have the authority to bind it off our life and we have the authority to loose healing, creative miracles, creative power of God, the creation. If we need a new heart, there's new hearts in heaven. I just got to release the creative power of God, the force of God to give me a new heart, to give me new kidneys, right, Pam? Give you new kidneys, give you new liver. Whatsoever is forbidden in heaven, I can forbid on earth. Whatsoever is released in heaven, I can release on earth. Are you getting this? You don't want to miss two strings. Hallelujah. Hmm. Hmm. Now, let's go back over here to the Lord's Prayer. I'm going to read it to you from this translation. Matthew 6. Matthew 6. Okay. I don't know how I got 16 in there, but I do. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Somebody say, pray in heaven down. Pray in heaven down. Say it. What's that mean? I'm commanding what's forbid, what, what is uh, available in heaven to hear what's okay to be in heaven I'm commanding it to move on earth as it is in heaven that's how the dead are resurrected right they're resurrected because there's eternal life in heaven and you and that's like uh, uh, Smith Wigglesworth he came home his wife was a minister he was a plumber and then he got saved and she had some disease and died before he got home and they come home and they said well your wife died she's been dead for hours he said, no, she's not. She's alive. Went in. This Welchman with a big mustache, big tall, grabbed her, stood her up and said, I command you to live and not die. Spirit of death come out of her. Spirit of life come out of her. And in her. And she choked and lived. Wow. It's documented. There was, a, a, he went to a, supposed to be a funeral or a viewing. A man been dead. And they were going in and out and giving their respects. He said, he's not dead. Why? See, 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 here's the thing. He saw that the gift of faith come on him and God wanted that man resurrected. So everybody in the earth realm saw he's dead. He wasn't breathing, wasn't talking. They laid him out for the viewing. He come in and he scrapped that man up. Everybody out of the room stood him up against the wall. I command you to live and not die. Boom. I picked him up. I command you to live and not die. Boom. The third time, I command you to live and not die. And he coughed and he, and he cried and he started hugging Smith Wigglesworth and walked out with him. I mean, that's documented. I think there's about six people raised from that, documented. People interviewed. Because he's, why did it happen for him? Because he knew how to pray down heaven. He knew how to access the unseen realm of God. Hmm. But that's for everybody. I said, so that's for me. So let's read this. Oh, Jesus. Hallelujah. So it says, if you want anything from God, you will have to pray down, pray into heaven. And then the prayer is what our father in heaven, how would be your name or thy name? What is this? This is a model of worship and honor and praising God. Everything with God in, begins in praise and thanksgiving and moves into worship. 
Praise and thanksgiving gives you access to the inner court. Psalms 100 or so says that we enter his courts with praise and thanksgiving, right? And thanksgiving is gratitude. Somebody say gratitude. He said, how would be your name? What's he saying? He's praising God's name and giving honor. And not just praising, but praising with honor. And, and when you honor the Father, it signifies honor return. You can't receive what you don't give. You got to determine, do people want what you have or want you? If they don't want you in a relationship, then don't give them what you have. You're just throwing it. The Bible says you're throwing pearls among swine. You're a gift from heaven. Yes. And, and, and the model prayer, there's definitely two key components. Number one, bringing God's kingdom to earth. It says, your kingdom come. This is the command to bring heaven's reality to our world. Amen. Bringing heaven's reality to our world. In other words, whatever's allowed in heaven can come to this world. Whatever's not in heaven cannot go that, that's not allowed we have authority over it he tells us in isaiah 42 13 the lord will march out like a champion and will triumph over his enemies god responds to worship god responds to that because that's intimacy with him and he brings triumph to his people to you and i another key component your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven the prayer here is to release heaven's reality on earth. Remember, we're the legislative body of his kingdom. We're the ones that have access to the authority, and we're the ones that delve out his authority. Heaven serves as a model for how earth shall look. We just read you Matthew 18 and what that meant. Now, it says the practical application, give us our daily bread, right? No one's, there's no one starving in heaven, are they? Bread represents also provision, finances, life, what you need for life. There's no unforgiveness in heaven. Then it says, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. God's kingdom is his possession, and he gives it to us. Remember, Jesus said, I can't give a drink of water in my name without you. Why? Because he's in heaven. Now, I'm going to read it to you from the trans. You got it up there? I'm going to read it from you, the, the Passion Translation. Jesus said, pray like this. Our beloved Father, dwelling in heavenly realms. You see, when I talk to you about the realms, right? May the glory of your name, glory, doxa, splendor, shining, made seen or made visible. Dwelling in the heavenly realms, plural, not singular, May the manifestation of your name be the center on which our lives turn. You're not going to always like be so tuned in, but you've got to be tuned in enough when it's, you need the access, you can have it. That's why you do devotions, you pray, you worship, that's why you attend services like this. Verse 10 manifest your kingdom realm. This is Jesus telling us how to pray. Manifest your kingdom realm. Make it visible. Make it seen. And cause your every purpose to be fulfilled on earth just as in heaven. God's purpose is eternal life, joy, peace, hope, love, right? Then Jesus said, we acknowledge you. Say this, we acknowledge you as our provider of all we need each day. Forgive us of our wrongs or our sins, which we have done as we ourselves release forgiveness to those who have wronged us. See, we don't want to be like the ones working in the vineyard and they were mad because Jesus gave, in the parable gave the same reward to one who just worked an hour versus all day, right? They didn't receive anything, but the one that worked an hour received everything or one day or whatever versus multiple days. Whoo! Yeah. Mm. Verse 13. Rescue us every time we face tribulation and set us free from evil. See, he wants to rescue and restore you from tribulation. You're going to suffer. You're going to have bad events happen because you live in a cursed world. But our prayer is we can have access to the heavenly realm to overcome that tribulation. And set us free from evil, all matters of addiction, fear, whatever. 
For you are the king who rules with power and glory forevermore. He is ruling, but you're his legislative body. You're the le legislator. You're the one that brings healing. You're the one that brings deliverance. You're the one he uses to bring salvation. You don't save them, but what happens is you stir people's faith to receive the grace that God gave them. You're saved through Jesus, right? You're saved by grace through faith, but you're the one that you're the one that hands it out. You're the one that puts it in action. You say, "Be healed, be whole from the authority of the heavenly realm." Through faith, faith is the vehicle. Faith is the monetary needs to access heaven to bring it into this realm. Amen. Let, me, let me read this. I'm going to pray for you. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. One of the key ways that we are healed, well, there's multiple ways we're healed. One is with your believing faith, right? Your mustard seed faith that God gave you, that if you believe in him and that he rose from the dead and all that, died and rose from the dead as the son of God and accept him as Lord and Savior of your heart, you, you will be saved. Then you get a mustard seed faith, a faith you can grow, right? So you can be healed by your own faith. In the word of God. Another way is you, you come before the elders or leadership or people of authority and want that have an anointing for healing and together you all pray and be healed. But here's a great way. One of them is one of the nine gifts of the spirit in first Corinthians 12, the power gifts, the working of, working of miracles, gift of faith and, um, healings, plural, gift of healings, plural. But here's where all that comes from. It comes from Hallelujah. The gift of faith comes from where? Out of uh, Mark 11, verse 20, it begins. Now in the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up for its roots. Remember Jesus a couple verses earlier, walked by, cursed the fig tree because it was not bearing fruit. And then so, and then Peter, remembering, said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered away. What's he say here to us? So Jesus answered and said to them, have faith in God. Now in the Aramaic and even in the Greek, it's not supposed to be an, in, it's supposed to be of. But the scribes were really afraid to put it in there. So you could study that out. The Greek word for that and even the Aramaic word is have the faith of God. Somebody say the faith of God. You see, my growing faith is faith in God, knowing and trusting God. Hebrews 11, 1, now faith, such things hope for, the evidence things not seen. Okay. But now this is the gift of faith, which is God's faith operating in a situation. He said, if you have the faith of God, for surely I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast in the sea, does not doubt or separate from his identity as a child of God, does not doubt in his heart, but believes in those things which he says will be done. So therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe you receive them and you will have them. Then it goes on and gives other teaching about forgiveness and all those. But what I want you to realize here, when you're healed through the gift, the gift of faith, what is that? That's the faith of God that suddenly brings an installment. God brings a sudden installment of his actual faith into a person to be released into the earthly realm. What is it? The gift of faith is God's faith. He'll give you an installment to release his faith into the earthly realm. The only way those people can be healed is if someone of faith could tap into God's faith, his gift of faith, to release it into the earth's realm. Every believer, Romans 12, 3, has some measure of faith. But healing comes, the great healings, when people come through the gift of faith or the faith of God. It's like all the nine gifts of the Spirit, right? In 1 Corinthians 12. It says that they're for every believer to use. And what are they? are in the operation of God and Holy Spirit. But it says, what? Three different categories, right? The word of knowledge, word of wisdom, certain spirits. There's... Um, 
uh, tongues, interpretation of tongues, prophecy, and then there's healings, which is plural, the only one's plural, and then there's miracles, signs and wonders, and then there's the gift of faith. The gift of faith is unique. It's actually in every one of them. Anytime there's a miracle, you read it in the Bible, it'll be two to three to four. It'll probably be about two different power gifts, like to have miracles. You got to have to get the faith to have it. You got to have discernment to know God wants to do it. That's one of the revelation gifts. And you got to have a revelation of wisdom to know God's going to manifest it. You see, he'll do three to five of these gifts will operate at the simultaneously to bring one installment from the heavenly realm to be a creative miracle or to bring someone and set them free. One of the things I do when I minister, and I'm be going to California and minister in a few days for signs and wonders, miracles, all that, is I prepare my heart to have access to the heavenly realm of whatever it is, whatever gifts he wants to use. Discernment, word of knowledge, word of wisdom, healings, whatever. And then I just obey. And one of the things he's taught me over the years, the Bible says we grow in these by the reason of use or the practice of them. The edifying of the saints. One of the things I do too, Mark, is I will look for certain anointings on people. So many times people will be in a service and we say their faith is built up. Know what really happened? They didn't have faith when they got there. And they wouldn't have normally had faith when they left because they're so caught up in the disease or the sickness or whatever it is. But but what happens is they're so so that's all they see because they hurt, they're in pain or whatever. But but the gift of faith is on them. When they all of a sudden didn't have faith to be healed, but they hear a word, get a revelation, a worship song, something God just comes down on them. They don't even know what it is. And it's God's faith comes on them. I have to have discernment to see who that is and call them out. Because if I don't call them out, they, most times they won't get the healing or the deliverance that they need to get. Sometimes they do, but most times they don't. So God uses men and women of God like me and you, sons and daughters of God, and trains us up, if we're willing to be trained, to move from the earth realm to the heavenly realm by faith and go into the unseen realm to bring into this earthly realm and the natural realm and bring something super into the natural to manifest his kingdom realm or his domain or government right in front of people. That's why the, in the end time church, the supernatural is so critical because the, the, the world is so analytical and angry and upset and unbelief because all these other things they're believing in that they, gets their attention. But when they see someone like Ashley get a new eardrum or, or Bill that went on to be the Lord Ed or what's his name? Bill, the roofer guy that got the new eye that was blind sitting right somewhere right about the third wall. Billy got a brand new eye, was blind in his eye for years. We've had uh, Sister Louise, when we didn't even have carpet, was in a nursing home, used to clean the church and volunteer, great woman, elderly lady, had went blind and she didn't have any family. She said, somebody brought her to church that morning. I just stopped for about 15 minutes for a preach. We didn't have carpet here yet. And I just started preaching on the gifts of, gifts of healing. And I said, if you want heal, come up. And I don't know, there's a couple dozen people come up. She started praising God before she got up and let loose of the person's hand, just run on up, praising God. I see, I see. I said, Miss Louise, where are you going? What's going on? I can see, I can see. I said, well, I see you can see because you're excited. <laughs> I was just teaching on the gifts of healing and miracles and, and just for like off the top of my heart. But what it did, God had set her up where the gift of faith that came on her so powerfully that she received her healing and brand new eyesight before she even got to the altar because the gift of faith was on her so strongly. God had put his faith on her to restore her eyesight. And she received it. Yes. And we had her read stuff. Remember that, Mark? Katie, we had her read signs. And she sat right there just reading away, reading all. And everybody, needless to say, everybody else got healed that day, too. Praise God. But we have stuff like that happening here. Everybody goes, that's good. That's cool. Because we're used to it. <laughs> But be careful. Remember this saying God gave me 30 years ago. That which is precious to you, be careful because that which is precious to you, if you ever let it become ordinary to your life, you'll soon replace it with someone or something else. <laughs>